What's up guys, Headphones Neil here, back with my with a quick review of my recent replay of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. So you may have if you remember I recently replayed the game for Android, but I went the full dark side route to see how the game held up, see if I could get through it on a mobile platform. And overall it went pretty well and I did enjoy the game. It mostly holds up aside from some of the graphics, but even then on high mode they actually hold up mostly well. I mean, you get us a couple of points where it's kind of blocky and washed out, but once you start getting into the game, it holds up for the most part. It's like 85-90% there. Um, you obviously don't get some of the more realistic effects of the game like other games these days, but it's something that's easier to overlook because the gameplay is that well. So I recently wanted to replay the game just to see how or just to, for for two basic reasons one to play the game on the light side mode to um to progress the storylines with the characters to see if i could progress them enough to get some of those side quests going and also to see if i could generate revan's robes from the star forge and if you follow my post on twitter you'll know that i did end up getting them so i'll touch base with that in a little bit but to start it off the game does hold up as far as the light side goes because when you choose the light side option, you get to progress a lot of the storylines with your characters. So, for example, with Karth Onassi, you get to learn that he had a son and that he survived the attack on his family with um, Karth, his son, and his wife. But his wife died and his son survived and became, and he joined up with the Sith. So that side story be, or side quest becomes an effort to find him, which he turns out, you learn about him on Manan, and then you find his Karth's son on Korriban, so that quest becomes um, a way to try to redeem Karth's son and turn him away from the Sith, and into, and not necessarily to the Republic, but at least away from the Sith. Um, if you, you also get to progress the storyline with Bastila, and as a bit of canon, you learn that Revan and Bastila fall in love, get married, and have children if my memory serves they have a daughter or they end up having a distant relative uh, who becomes Satali Shan who becomes a member of the um, Jedi Order during the time of the video game night the video game the Old Republic the MMORPG that they released um, so I believe that's still canon um, if I remember correctly but don't quote me on that but essentially the storyline with Bastila and Revan during Knights of the Old Republic 1 is that they fall that they end up have falling in love and you can express love for each other and progress that storyline with a relationship. Um, I think the one story that continue that you're still able to progress regardless of light side or dark side affiliation is with Candorus as far as him telling you stories about um, the past and with the, the Mandalorian Wars and all of that so there's no real benefit to either affiliation when you um, talk to him. Um, if you progress the story as a light side, also you get to keep the character Juhani in your party. So when you meet her in the grove on Dantooine, if you're on the dark side, um, to, to show your dominance, you end up killing her to get the extra dark side points. But if you redeem her, then she'll join your party and you can progress her storyline to not only keep her in the party and change her affiliation to the light side, but you learn more about, about her party and her past. You learn that uh, she had a classmate on Dantooine who um, was in love with her, and she rejected him for that uh, for because they were part of the Jedi Order. But you meet up with him on Dantooine, and they kind of reconcile their ways on that part. Um, you also get a story arc where you learn that. Um, there was a slaver who killed Juhani's parents when she was a kid right around the time that the Jedi came and saved her so that becomes more of an expansive story arc on her part and then you end up killing that slaver to um, to um, end that storyline but you also get but she also has a temptation to continuously fall to the dark side and you can continue to save her I forget if I get light side points for saving her but you do get experience points for finishing that story arc. Um, the ones, and actually with Bastila, sorry to jump around a little bit, but there is a story arc that I remember where you can meet her mother on um, Tatooine, if I remember right, in the cantina, but for some reason I wasn't able to get that story arc, so I don't know if I did something out of order or 
I didn't have her enough on my story or because you have the storyline with falling in love with her. If you forget that story arc before you meet the mother, it doesn't activate. But um, I know there is that storyline as well, so you can have Basila reconcile with her mom as far as driving Basila apart from her father. But in a related story, um, with Mission Veo, if you have her in your, or if you um, keep her around, you can, you learn that she, uh, or if you progress her story arc a little bit, then you can learn that she has a brother, Griff, who's still alive, ran away with his girlfriend, and um, if you meet up, or, or if you progress that storyline enough, then you can um, try to meet him on Tatooine and um, complete that story arc, but if you do it out of order, so if you get the story arc after you um, complete the mission, the um, part of the world on Tatooine to, with the Sand People Enclave, then you're not going to be able to finish that story arc. So you, when you go to Tatooine and you go to the Circa office, you can learn about um, Griff once you progress enough with a story with um, Mission Veo, and then when you go to the Sand People Enclave, you can, and if you stay on the light side and you try to have them quiet down, you will eventually learn that um, Griff was there, you'll learn, find his data pad, you'll learn that he was being held captive there. And um, once you go back to um, Anchorhead and you talk to the Zerk office, you'll learn that he actually had uh, gotten what he came for and ran away. So um, it kind of is neither here nor there, but at least you know that he's alive and he hasn't changed. So missions, storyline, and quest kind of remains the same, but at least you can settle that story arc and get some experience points there. So overall, these are some of the things that you can do in the game, which definitely hold up over all this time since the game came out in 2003. Um, so I want to say that both sides of the force in the game are very well done. When you go on the dark side, you get some, you get to, I will say that with the dark side, you get a lot of awesome powers like um, drain life and on um, the force lightning um, and things like that but the things that you miss out on by doing that is you don't get a lot of the story arcs that you get by playing on the light side because um, you're generally being a jerk and an a-hole so in order to get more dark side points so by doing that you by going on the light side you can expand on all of these story arcs and you get for a longer and more filling gameplay um, neither side of the game is um, easier or harder by staying with one affiliation, but it is definitely a game where you do need to have one affiliation or the other so you can maximize your force points. It does not really work to stay in the middle so you can expand on more force powers, but um, this time around I want to say that it felt a little bit easier. I don't think I died as many times as I did on the dark side. Um, I want to say mostly probably because... If I was keeping the keeping it in game, I want to say because I had more Jedi and Force powers to play on the game, so it worked out better. While where I was able to heal myself and protect myself, so it went better. But the um, outside of the game, I would say that probably because now that I'm used to the game and I kind of knew where everything, or I was able to refresh my memory for where what everything where everything was and what everything was going on, that. Um, I was able to kind of work around that and not die as many times. So overall, I do recommend that playing the game if you ha if you enjoyed the game on the, your desktop. The thing that definitely does not hold up or that was not translated well was the skills points allocation system. That is still definitely a pain to navigate through. It's overly small and hard to navigate. So I was kind of I kind of hope that if they st update the game at some point make it better to play on uh, mobile is that they update that screen and make it bigger so it's easier to read. Um, I would rather have those icons be bigger and scroll around kind of like how you see in the in your journal or your map or your when you're looking at your inventory just to make it more normalized rather than do a literal port from the desktop so um, the game is probably easier to play on a tablet just because of the screen size so even on a OnePlus 8 Pro which 
has around a six inch screen or a little bit bigger than a six inch screen it's still small on that screen but i mean it's real it's easy to read but you still do have to squint a little bit so it's probably easier to play on a tablet because of the even bigger screen size but the game is still playable you do have to squint a little bit more to see what force powers you're playing you do have to um, poke around a couple of times in order to select the right force power that you want to pick so overall i do still recommend playing the game it definitely holds up sometimes the, che- the cutscenes get a bit cheesy but Overall, it still is a fun game to play, and I do hope that they release Knights of the Old Republic 2 for Android at some point, so um, I can replay that and walk down memory lane for that game. But that's all for this review, and since um, I'm done with Knights of the Old Republic, and I mentioned this on my review for Doom Unrated, but the next game review that um, I'll be uh, playing and sharing is Doom 1. So yes, the original game from, I want to say, late 80s, early 90s, I forget when it came out, maybe 93 if memory serves, Um, but um, I'm going to be playing that for Android, of course. I've been, I poked around with some of the settings and all that, so the game, I'm going to play the game at the moment in 16 by 9 aspect ratio at 120 um, frames per second. And yes, Doom 1 did come out in 93. So yeah, but back to what I was saying. But yeah, I'll be playing the game at the moment in 16 by 9 ratio um, at 120 frames per second apparently in the game. So it supports the OnePlus 8 Pro's high refresh rate. Um, first couple levels are probably just going to be to orient my the gameplay playing on a mobile device with touchscreen. Um, I forget what recent gameplay it's kind of similar to, um, but as far as the controls, I think Max Payne I want to say, so once I get used to playing Doom with the touchscreen, I'm going to go through that. I will admit that I have not played the game in full before. I think I've only really played the shareware version maybe, and if that, the first couple of levels. I think mostly just because I forget maybe how far the shareware version of the game went, but I think well, I don't remember why I never finished playing the game. I probably, I've just never gotten around to it. So now that it's available for mobile, I think I will, and they'll of course be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So um, YouTube channel is youtube.com/pateln01. You can find me on Twitter at pateln01 for feedback, posts, and all that good stuff. The website is pateln01.com for past episodes, subscription links, and all supporting the show and all of that good stuff. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next time.